Okay, so the next method of finding the volume of 3D shapes using calculus is called the washer method. And I will show you why in a second. Um, let's go back and review area for one second here, okay? Um, I have two functions here. One of them is from the last video. It is f of x equals 4x minus x squared. That's my frowning parabola here. The other one is this line, g of x. And I told Desmos to graph the line y equals x. So g of x just equals x. Quick review, I'm going to find the area between these two functions. And the way I like to do that is first make sure that I have a nice representative Riemann rectangle. Actually, it was a better rectangle before I tried to draw it by hand. Um, the base of the rectangle will still be delta x. The height of the rectangle will be the function on top minus the function on the bottom, which in this case is f of x minus g of x. The area of my single Riemann rectangle would be its height, f of x minus g of x times delta x. The area of an infinite number of these rectangles added together would be an integral, but wait, there's one thing I haven't done yet. Um, I don't know where they intersect. I know it looks like they intersect, but I didn't give out that information. And if I were just given these equations and directions that would say something like, find the area bound by these two functions, bound meaning closed off, well, I have to figure out where they meet. And the simplest way to do that is to set the functions equal to each other. So I'm going to have a new equation to solve in a second. 4x minus x squared equal to x. Okay, this will tell me the x coordinates of where they intersect, and since I'm setting up an integral, that's all I need. Don't need to care about how high they are. So, although it's pretty easy to calculate when one of them is the line y equals x, but don't need to worry about that right now. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this as a quadratic. I'm going to move everything to the right side of the equation. So I'm going to add x squared to both sides, and I'm going to subtract 4x from both sides, giving me 0 equals x squared minus 3x. I'm going to solve for my multiple solutions here by factoring an x out of each term. And then I'm going to set each factor equal to 0. That's got a fancy name, special property of 0. Two factors with variables multiplied together equal 0. The solutions are the solutions that you get when you set each factor equal to 0. Only works if the things you're multiplying multiply together to make 0. This gives me x equals 0. Okay, cool. Well, that's this x-coordinate where they meet. That checks out. The other solution is x equals 3, which is, looks about right, halfway between 2 and 4. Okay, that works. So to find this area, I now know that I need to make an integral from 0 to 3 f of x, 4x minus x squared minus, need another parenthesis here to make sure everyone knows it's inside the same integral, x dx, top function minus bottom function for the height of the rectangle, times the base of the rectangle, and my area will be the integral from 0 to 3 of 3x minus x squared dx, fairly straightforward antiderivative here, I get 3x squared over 2, 
minus x cubed over 3 from 0 to 3. Again, one advantage, we'll plug in 3, but then we don't really have to worry about plugging in 0, because plugging in 0 when every term just has an x in it is going to make those terms go away. So this is going to be 3 times 3 squared over 2 minus 3 cubed over 3. A little factoring trick to make this a little easier on myself. I mean, I've got 3 cubed in this denominator and 3 cubed in this denominator. How about I just factor that out of both terms and just deal with what's left, which is 1 half minus 1 third. Common denominator is 6, so that's 3 over 6 minus 2 over 6. So that will get me 27, 3 cubed, times 1 sixth. Uh, that will be, divide both by 3, that is going to be 9 halves. Sorry for the small writing there towards the end. Um, but that's how I find the area bound between 4x minus x squared and y equals x. Okay? Now, though, let's say we want to find a volume. Now, last time we used something called the disk method to find the volume of an area that we spun around the x-axis, okay? I want to find a different volume now. I want to find the volume you get when you spin this Riemann rectangle right around, um, actually, wait. I'm going to spin it around the x-axis again, okay? Take a quick break here because I have to change something in one of my later slides because there's two ways to do this, and I had it set up to do a different way, but we are going to use something called the washer method, where we are going to spin this Riemann rectangle around, and we are going to get a cylinder, just like the disk method, but that cylinder is going to have a hole in the middle. Actually, before I take a break, I will set this part up. Okay, so we've got a cylinder with a hole in it, which is called a washer in a hardware store. If you go looking for a piece of metal that looks like this, usually very small, it's called a washer, so this is called the washer method. Uh, the way to find the volume of a single washer is really straightforward, actually. It's the volume of a cylinder with a big radius, which we will call capital R, minus the hole in the middle, which is the volume is found by finding the volume of a smaller cylinder, which has a smaller radius, which we call lowercase r. Big R is big radius, little r is little radius. That's about as straightforward as a math formula gets. This height refers to the height of both cylinders in this case, this height is horizontal. Cylinders are normally on their side, but this one's standing upright. Uh, and that height, we'll start calling it delta x because it comes from our Riemann rectangle, and the thickness of our Riemann rectangle is a delta x. Ours get a little bit more confusing, but the way this will work out in this volume formula, let's simplify it a little bit. We can factor a pi out of both terms. We can factor an h out of both terms, which I'll put here at the end. And I'm going to change that h to delta x to start making this look like the integral form will leave in it, where it'll be a dx. All that's left in this first term is r squared. All that's left in this next term is lowercase r squared. And you know what, we'll go ahead and talk about this some more before I take that break and set up, fix that animation that I made. That isn't quite what I want. Okay, so, um, what, where do we get the capital R and the lowercase r from? Well, let's see what color will stick out enough here. The capital R is the radius of the larger cylinder. And the radius of the larger cylinder goes from the x-axis way up to the function that was on top. 
function that was on top of our Riemann rectangle, which is how we figured this all out. So this total distance from zero up to the bigger function, that's my capital R. My lowercase r, in this case, is going to be from the x-axis to the lower function. Okay? So that's going to be how I find both those quantities in terms of the functions. Well, what's the upper function again? That's f of x. This lower function, the one whose y values are below the top one, is g of x. f of x is still 4x minus x squared. g of x is just x. And so my integral that describes the total volume is pi times the integral. It's the same bound region we just found the area of. So that's from 0 to 3. And getting real latency issues on my interactive whiteboard here. Capital R squared. Well, capital R is the distance from 0 to the top function. It's a y value, so it's just 4x minus x squared. But in this case, the entire function is squared as well. Minus g of x squared, which is just x. And try to keep these notes neat. That squared, our delta x becomes a dx because now from this step to this step, we are no longer finding the volume of a single cylinder. We are finding the volume of an infinite number of infinitely thin cylinders all added together. And we would calculate this integral, which I will do in the notes, but I won't use right now. Uh, I'll go back and add the correct animation to this video. But real quick, first of all, I can show you this part might help. Um, let's see here. Okay, so here's the same animation, same uh, visual you just saw, but I do have the ability to make it, let's see if I can do this. Yep, I have this set up. I can show you, give you some idea what the shape I want will look like. Uh, for one thing, I wanted to stop at uh, x equals 3. So we're finding the volume of the shape that looks like an infinite number of these infinitely thin cylinders. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Okay, so left you on a bit of a cliffhanger last time. We had set up the integral that would describe the volume of what you got when you added up the volumes of an infinite number of infinitely thin washers, that is cylinders with a proportional many cylinder removed from the center. Um, we set up the volume of a single cylinder based on our Riemann rectangle. We set up the integral and rather than take the time to work this out, I thought I'd show you what some of you already know, which is that your calculator and actually calculate integrals. I want you to notice I left the pi out. Didn't want to multiply this times an irrational number. Um, had the calculator determine the integral and had the calculator represented as a fraction, because a lot of times even on the calculator section of an AP exam, the answers will look like this, 108 pi over five. So assuming I typed this correctly into the calculator, which looks at a glance like I did, um, with the pi removed, I can turn my answer into a fraction and then add the pi afterwards. Putting the pi in first will make that step problematic to say the least. And that gives us some idea of, what is the exact idea of the volume of this shape. What does this shape look like? That's where I realized I had the wrong animation. Um, let's go back to GeoGebra and show you the washers being generated, a cylinder with a smaller cylinder in the middle taken out, 
And it's a little harder to see here as it's generated, but the volume we found is actually the volume in between these two shapes. It's the volume of the outer shape minus the volume of this inner area. And this isn't the worst angle to see that at. It's almost like a, a basket, it looks like, but it's really solid. And even though the outer shape looks almost like a hovercraft tire wheel of some sort, the inside that's carved out is a perfect cone because it came from a straight line. So imagine that sort of wheel tire shape with a cone sliced out of the middle. That's the shape we just found the volume of. You don't have to be able to picture the 3D shapes in order to find the volumes accurately, but sometimes it helps. I put a couple of these shapes into your PowerPoint for your notes. So this might help you visualize what's going on, which again, sometimes helps. The outer shape is determined the same way as we did with the disk method in the last video, finding all these infinitely thin cylinders going from the parabola out around the x-axis. And from that, we take out a central section formed by just spinning this line around the x-axis. Since the line goes through the origin and up at the angle, spinning it around the x-axis gives us a cone. So it's a some sort of yeah, bicycle tire minus a cone, maybe, you know, or a motorcycle tire. It's not a perfect shape. Anyway, um, hope this video helped, and I will see you all in class.